morning. This is the basic course on industrial instrumentation. Uh, as you know, the instrumentation is very important subject for uh, in all process industry. Uh, as you know, in the industry, uh, in the like steel, um, petrochemicals, then fertilizers, all these type of I mean industry, the instrumentation is a I mean subject which is uh, concerned for everybody. The reason is. And there are various sensors in the instrumentation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and you will find that uh, some of the sensors are huge in number, especially flow, temperature, and all those things. And you have to measure, then you have to uh, convert it in the some convenient domain, which can be I mean signal process later on, and transmit those signal to the control room. Now, ultimately you know that all these measurements and instrumentation is basically to uh, make your uh, product or quality of the product better. Suppose in the fertilizer plants, the quality of product should be uh, good, urea, urea that means uh, the purity of the urea or the in the case of steel industry percentage of the um, carbon in the steel, all those things are important. And every I mean step you will find we have to measure some parameters. What are those parameters? The parameters are pressure, temperature, flow, humidity, viscosity, pH, all those things. The reason that we have given the name of the course as a industrial instrumentation instead of instrumentation is uh, that you see we will always focus on the to some process industries. That means, what type of uh, measurements they are doing and uh, how that measurement is converted to electrical domain so that I can get a current of 40, 20 million ampere and all those things. Now, um, Today is the first lecture, so obviously I will I mean, introduce the different uh, components and I will cover to some extent the static characteristics uh, of the, I will cover full the static characteristics and the dynamic characteristics I will start in the next lesson. In the lesson 1, let us look at the um, contents. The lesson 1 it is basically as I told introduction. The contents of this uh, lesson is getting started that means basic introduction to the uh, system. Then I will cover the static characteristics. Now the static characteristics it means that the accuracy, linearity, sensitivity etc. are the parameters of an instrument or sensor and these attributes are collectively known as the static characteristics of an instrument and are given in the data sheet for a particular instrument. Now at the end of this uh, lesson, the viewer will know the static characteristics of the industrial instrumentation, the importance of instrumentation in process industry. Now, classification of instruments, so uh, I mean instrument can be classified in four different categories, I mean it can have active and passive instruments, then in the case of active instruments you know that you have uh, displacement sensors or uh, potentiometer, so in the case of displacement sensor uh, or a, uh, I mean you can have in the case of active instrument that is the displacement sensor, suppose I have a displacement sensor, it looks like this that I have so, displacement, suppose I have a potentiometer like this and I am giving energize it by battery and I am taking the output voltage from this one. So, this is the wiper and or the jockey of the um, your potentiometer displacement sensors and I am taking the output from this two uh, region. I am sorry, it should look like this, it should be I mean I have a displacement sensor. So, I am giving a this is our jockey and I am taking measuring. So, this suppose this is the voltage E naught if it supply the E x excitation voltage and this voltage E naught. 
obviously you can see that e naught if we displace it in this direction suppose x so that e naught will be a function of x if the x changes our e naught also will change so in this case we can find that this is a, a displacement sensor and i need an excitation voltage here if you don't give the excitation voltage my potentiometer obviously will not work and i i won't get any output voltage there so, this type of instrument I should uh, call it or we should call it an active instrument or active sensor. Now, there are some sensors which are uh, passive, passive in the sense suppose I have a uh, Burdo gauge which is used and we will discuss that in later on. Uh, that Burdo gauge you know there is a C type of tube, it looks like this. I have a, a C tube. and this area of cross section of the tube is elliptical. Now, if you increase the pressure here, so the tube will try to make in circular form that means it will have a circular form like this one. So, accordingly this tip of the uh, our tube will move in these directions. So, this movement of the tip, this movement of the tip can be uh, utilized to uh, move some pointer on the scale. So, that with that some arrangements of uh, racket and pinion and all those things you can find that the it will move on a scale like this one. So, in this case that it will work as an um, it is an passive instrument it is not an active instrument. Uh, moreover please note that uh, uh, active instrument does not mean it is only electrical active instruments can be also be pneumatic because I have told about the active instruments which is only passive but active instrument is also uh, is also the it can be in a pneumatic instruments it can have also hydraulic instrument where the, there is supply always supply now force balance systems or you can uh, flapper nozzle systems most of you are familiar with or we will cover this I am sorry you are not familiar with it now you will be familiar with uh, with the systems after some time or after few lectures that you will find that uh, this uh, the flapper nozzle systems you need always a power supply I mean use a pneumatic supply. So, without supply the flapper nozzle systems cannot work. Similarly, hydraulic systems also. I need I mean, some hydraulic, some liquid, some like like oil or water or kerosene, that type of thing, so that it will be activated. So that type of instruments are active instrument. And the choice uh, between the active and passive instruments uh, involves carefully balancing the measurement, the resolution. Uh, these are the requirements uh, and the against cost. The reason you see that uh, in the case of uh, I mean just let us go back to again and to this potentiometer you see that um, when we discuss the potentiometer we have seen that the we have the potentiometer here we have a power supply here and we are taking this is our wiper which moves in this direction x and I am getting an output voltage E naught. Now, you see that uh, resolution of this potentiometer that means output voltage can be made uh, better and better if I suppose if I increase the supply voltage value whereas and this is very simple I mean it is just to increase the supply voltage E x excitation voltage and the measurement resolution will increase right. Whereas, in the case of the passive instrument it is not very easy suppose as I told you as I show you the Gordo tube which is used for measurement of I mean uh, measurement of pressure or suppose uh, one of the one of the good example is a mercury in glass manometers all of you are familiar with how does it look it looks like all of you have seen that we have a uh, tube like this one and then there is mercury column bulb here. So, and mercury which will heat up it will go up like this one. So, in this case the resolution if I want to change the resolution it is not very easy task. So, I mean you have to change the entire constructions of the system that means the uh, capillary should be more thinner and all those things so that I will get for a smaller and smaller measurements of temperature. But that is not necessary in the case of uh, there is in the case of electrical instruments or suppose uh, where the I have some excitations or pneumatic instruments or a hydraulic instrument that we already discussed. Now there are null and deflection type of instrument this is very important null and deflection type of instruments you see that uh, if I say here, how does it what is this null deflection time? All of you are familiar with the 
Whitstone Beach. How does it look? It looks like this. This is our Whitstone Beach. I have a uh, power supply here and I am measuring the output voltage here E naught. Suppose this is R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4. Simple, I can write that R 1 is equal to R 4 by R 3 into R 2. Is not it? At balance, I can write like this one when there is no, I mean, no current flowing. Uh, through the detector. This, suppose this is a detector or voltmeter. Now, null type means you see that I can utilize suppose this R 1 varies. Suppose R 1 is a thermistor which is measuring some um, voltage, uh, some temperatures and this obviously what will happen that if the temperature rises the value of the R 1 will fall. Now, I can utilize either um, R 4 or R 2 to balance the bridge. So, if I use some resistance R4 and R2, suppose R2 is also varying, so in that case it is a null type of instrument. Whereas, if I utilize this, suppose whenever there is a uh, this uh, R1, initially suppose all the bridge all the equal, so a bridge is balanced. Now, R1 since it is a thermistor as the temperature rises, this resistance will fall. I will get an unbalanced voltage at the detector side. So, this voltage actually you will uh, you can say that it is a now the instrument down now the our system is a deflection type systems it is no more a null and means I can calibrate this output voltage that means I calibrate this unbalanced voltage in terms of the temperature or in terms of the resistance R1. So, that is possible. So, this is the difference between null and deflection type of instrument. Sometimes we prefer to have a null type of instrument, sometimes we I mean prefer to have a deflection type of instrument, especially in the case of electrical circuits when we need always some output voltage we should go for the deflection type of instrument. But in some precisions we need a null because always whenever the uh, you if you make the bridge null obviously it is the most accurate uh, form of measurement. Now, monitoring and transmitting instrument, what does it mean? It means that that mercury in glass manometer, there is a good example of the monitoring instrument, mercury in glass manometer as you know uh, you have seen or suppose a flow meter, suppose a rotameter, it is a common example of the, I mean how does it look is rotameter, we will discuss in details in later on. So, it has an uh, shape like this one a vessel and it is uh, there is a float or bob, so it will go like this one. So, liquid is flowing through this and going out. So, this liquid will move up and down, right? The liquid will move up and down, and these uh, positions of the bob, position of the bob can be calibrated in terms of the flow, right? So, this type of instrument is only monitoring instrument, you cannot say it is a transmitting instrument, right? Or mercury in glass manometer that is also a transmitting instrument because you are reading only the temperature. But suppose if I use a thermocouple there instead of I mean instead of a marketing glass manometer if I use a thermocouple. In the case of thermocouple what will happen you know that you can you will get a voltage there whenever there is a change difference of temperature between the two junctions of the thermocouple of the dissimilar metals you will get a voltage there. So, that voltage can be calibrated in terms of temperature. Similarly, in the case of RTD or resistance temperature detectors which is very accurate uh, form of measurements of temperature you will find also there that if the um, temperature varies the resistance will vary. So, that change of resistance can be um, taken as as I have shown in the last uh, slide that can be utilized as an unbalanced voltage. So, that unbalanced voltage can be calibrated in terms of the temperature. So, this is also because that signal is can be transmitted. Now, one thing you should know that in the industry that usually or you cannot transmit voltage, you have to transmit current even though it is not very relevant whether it is monitoring or transmitting instruments, but I am discussing this is important since it is industrial instrument you must know what is the practical aspects of the sensor signal conditioning circuitry. Any signal which is electrical in nature you are not supposed to I mean transmit voltage, voltage if you transmit it will be totally corrupted by the noise you have to transmit current. So, typical standard for industry is the 4 to 20 milli ampere of current that is for the total range of temperature, pressure, flow, etcetera. 
So, this is the difference between monitoring and transmitting sort of instruments. So, all the instruments there are some instruments which are both monitoring and transmitting that means it has monitoring system also it is monitoring the temperatures on board you will find the on the panel itself you will find the temperature itself also it has a transmitting capability. If it is has no transmitting capability there is a transmitter which is to be utilized to convert that signal I mean to the uh, current domain transmitter is a very common form in industry you will find that many a times we are talking about this transmitter. The um, function of this transmitter is to uh, convert the signal whether it is pneumatic signal, electrical signal, hydraulic signal to convert to 4 to 20 milli ampere of electrical current. This will be convert I mean transmitted to the control room for taking the control actions which will be ultimately activate, activate some of the control valve like this one with to control flow or heater heating to the some uh, heating to some heater or heating power to the heater and all those things. Or we can have analog or uh, digital instrument. Now, in the case of analog instrument output varies continuously. It is a there can be infinite symbol I mean positions of the pointer. Suppose I have a uh, simple uh, if I say that if I have a simple voltmeter suppose I have a voltmeter if I take a well uh, I have voltmeter so what, so what will happen the pointer will move is not it. So, I have a calibrated scale here in volts so pointer will move. So, in a case of analog instrument when you talk the analog instrument you will find there is infinite 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 position of the pointer it you can have many positions whereas in the case of digital instrument this is not the case in the digital instrument output varies in the discrete forms it is not continuous. So, in that case uh, we will consider the digital instrument sometimes my people talk about I mean talk about suppose a revolution counter whether that is a digital I will not consider that as a digital digital instrument so far is I mean today is concerned we talk of the digital instruments where you have some digital circuitry and the output is also digital. Suppose if you have a virtual instrumentation which is actually a, I mean digital instrumentation, but we are showing that like a conventional analog meter it is not necessary it is an analog instrument. So, in that sense I say if the signal conditioning there itself inside the system is the, or the instrumentation system is digital in nature we call it digital instrument whereas in the case of analog instruments it has a analog in nature. But please note that in analog instrument that can be analog meter there can be uh, many positions of the pointer on the scale whereas in the case of digital instruments there are finite number of positions of the output this is all about the digital and analog instrument. Now, let us look at a process diagram which will show you glimpse you I mean give you some idea of the instrumentation system and why we have given the name of the industrial instrumentation instead of simple instrumentation instrumentation devices and all those things. Now, this is a typical process you look at this is a typical process here you see that a liquid is flowing through this pipe and it is going out right and there is orifice plate. Now, what will happen you see there is two tappings here one is upstream tapping and another is downstream tapping. So, this tapping means that it will the pressure the flow whatever the liquid is flowing through the pipe our ultimate goal I have a set point that I have a set point some fixed value of suppose L liter per minute that liquid I have to I should always or that liquid should always that this rate of the liquid should be maintained through this pipe that is our ultimate goal. In many a situation you will find this type of whether steel chemical plants you will find this type of situations when might be water might be naphtha and so many things are there where you have to make measure the flow. Now, you see what will happen that liquid is flowing. So, there is a upstream tapping and downstream tapping. What is the function? You will, you will see later on you see that uh, in the case of flow meter the flow is converted in terms of pressure because as you know that when the liquid is flowing through this pipe here the flow is uh, whenever it is flowing through this region the flow is high. If the flow is high then what will happen the pressure will drop. So, there is a high pressure zone and it is a low pressure zone. So, this I will take 
uh, through a uh, tapping this is called upstream tapping and downstream tapping and I am given to a DP transmitter. DP transmitter means is a differential pressure transmitter. Sometimes back people used to call it a DPDT differential pressure differential transmitter, but nowadays uh, more reasonably people call it uh, just DP transmitter or differential pressure transmitter. Why it is differential pressure? Because you see I have to measure, I have to look at, I have to take the tapping both upstream and downstream. So, because these are restrictions, so this we call upstream, this downstream and this differential pressure is going to a DP transmitter. Now, this DP transmitter is I mean according to flow it is giving a signal pneumatic signal of 3 to 15 psi. PSI means pounds per square inch even though this uh, nowadays as you know it is an SI system, but still in some cases uh, people use uh, more convenient with the PSI which for some reason even though while we solve the problem we will find that we are using SI system, but still industry will they use this type of um, units it is not a problem. Now this, um, this uh, 3 to 15 PSI of pressure that means varies that means for almost no flow I will get a 3 PSI of pressure. For, flu, for full flow of the liquid I will get a 15 psi of pressure. So, this flow uh, I mean this will go to the a pressure to current converter. Now, pressure to current converter what it will do? It will convert that signal pneumatic signal to the current domain. As I told you earlier you see that you have to transmit the pneumatic signal, electrical signal, hydraulic signal to the electrical domain. So, 4 to 20 milliampere of current. Now, what is this 4 to 20 milliampere? As you say, it is from for 3 psi, I have a 4 milliampere of current, for 15 psi, I have a 20 milliampere of current. This range you have to maintain. Whatever the range of the flow, it does not matter because accordingly it will be because this will remain constant. It might be in a huge flow, might be it can be. 10 to the power 5 liter uh, per hour and that type of suppose in a power station, water pumping station all those things a huge amount of liquid is flowing or in some narrow uh, pipe that might be it is few I mean a liter it does not matter. The range will be always the which is converted will be always 3 to 15 psi for the pneumatic signal and for the uh, for the current signal it is 4 to 20 milliampere. But nowadays as you know this thing entire thing are incorporated in one. DP transmitter where you will get directly this 4 to 20 milliampere of current this load you do not need P to I converter and all these things everything is in incorporated inside. So, we will see that uh, you will utilize this uh, differential pressure to make a, um, a uh, will utilize it for a change of positions of a diaphragm plate in the case of capacity measurement. So, that I will get differential of capacitance we will discuss later on. And uh, accordingly I will get a current. Now, this current is coming to a controller. The controller the function of the controller is to give a control signal to the pneumatic control valve. I have a set point because set what is set point? Set point will set the value of the flow of the liquid L liter suppose or suppose 1000 liter per minute or that type of the very high 1000 liter per minute or I should say 1000 liter per hour that, that type of set points we have done. Now, if for some reason or the other if this falls then what will happen I have to open the valve. So, the more liquid will flow or for some reason or the other suppose that this this is in is this has increased that means flow has increased then what we will get I will get a I will get a flow I have to close the valve right. So, that type of signal you have to go, go you have to put to the uh, control valve. So, that control where I will get that signal I will get the signal I will subtract this signal I have a set point I have a signal. So, these two signal will be subtracted when you will future we will study the control systems you will find all those things in details. That means, I have a systems here and I have a this is our set point and this is our error. So, this will be kept subtract and this will come to the controller. Okay this I have a process it will take actions or it like this one anyway. So, I have a that means, I have a controller process I have a measurement it is coming like so, this is our set point this is our output from the DP transmitter right. So, this is coming our so our goal is to make this R equal to C 
that means these two should remain. So, if there is a difference, I will get a error voltage. So, our controller will take some actions. So, it will send some signal to the control bulb and all this, it will take some action, it will make so that it will, it will move in a such a direction so that ES will be again 0, right. Here also it is same you th see that what will happen that if, if, if it increases, if the flow increases my valve is to be closed. So, this flow if the flow increases this current will also will increase. So, there is a there is a set point there is a error. So, this is the error signal which is coming from that this error signal also should be 4 to 20 milli ampere because I cannot transmit anything other than 4 to 20 milli ampere. So, this will come to the because this uh, valve is pneumatic most of the industrial valve as you know is a pneumatic valve because in many industries like the especially hydrocarbon industries and all these things petrochemical industry all these things you cannot use uh, our solenoid valve electrically operated valve because of the safety reasons because the operating voltage should be below 50 volt. So, there is a restriction. So, if for a uh, large pipe and all those things I cannot use there all those small um, control valves. So, I have to use pneumatic control, but pneumatic control valve means that signal should be pneumatic to close or open. So, to, to close and open I have to give pneumatic signal. So, ultimately what is that? That very precisely I, I, I should say that if I the flow is increased. So, I will get a signal through this transmitter this will convert to the current domain going to the controller I have a set point. So, obviously, if flow has increased there is a there is error voltage it will come. So, the stem of the valve will go down the flow of the valve will be control this action will take until and unless this error signal will become 0 right or this volt this current and this set point will remain same. It is in other way also if the flow suppose decreases then what will happen that the flow decreases I will again also get some error voltage, but of opposite sign obviously. So, the what will happen? So, I have to take some action. So, so that the control valve should stem should go out. So, that I will get a flow which is actually to the set point. So, it will the action will be taken until unless this error current will become 0 right. Now, uh, with this I will uh, go to the instrumentation laboratory of IIT Kharagpur. Uh, so, where you can see some of the instruments or process instruments you will get the um, glimpses of how it looks like and how the different flow meter works and what actually the process looks like. We have some uh, small I mean, process I mean by which you can get the idea of the what is the instrumentation system we talk about we will come back after some time. This is the uh, a flow and level control system which is actually the scale down version of the actual process and what actually it is the system is doing that uh, it has different sensors. Uh, what I want to mean that you see the instrumentation is everywhere. You will find that there are several sensors, there are float level sensors, there are flow sensors, there are several control valves. So, the goal of this process is that basically to control the level as well as flow in a particular process. Now, the several sensors will take, I mean will play, play actually very key role in the system. Because you see the everywhere you will find that the sensor's output is most important for actual control of the whatever the control systems you are using that is uh, it is important as well as that the whatever the uh, sensor output which is coming from the sensors is also important. So, the sensors calibrations, is accuracy, is resolutions also will control the basic process. Any process has some output, it has some suppose if you go to the petrochemical process it has some uh, diesel output or petrol output or kerosene output or any other uh, type of materials. Or if you go to fertilizer plant they will find that you will find that there are different types of fertilizers are coming out. But the quality of the fertilizers or quality of the diesel, quality of the petrol will ultimately decided by the not only by the control algorithms which you are using in the plant as well as by the sensor. If the sensors are not accurate, if the instrumentation system is not accurate, then you will find that the entire quality control is out of order. 
So that this tells that the how instrumentation is important in industry. Now I will describe at least two sensors. One of these is you see there is a uh, rotor meter, which is a uh, flow meter. It will give the estimate of the flow of the liquid uh, in the entire process. Now you see in the rotor meter there is a taper tube with a very small angle, and the liquid is coming in to this side, and the liquid is coming out to that. And there is a float, uh, in some uh, in the technical persons they call it bob also. As the liquid uh, flow increases, this bob will move up. Now, the details of these um, different forces which is acting on the float will be discussed later on. Now, you can just remember here what will happen that when the float goes up, that means the liquid flow also increases here. Here you can see here there is one uh, one float sensor which is a conditionality float sensor. Due to the different level of the, you can see that this liquid can go up. You can see here this float will go up like this one as the liquid goes up, and potentiometer will move and it will give the electrical output. Now any process or any instrumentation system, one thing you must remember that which will be discussed later on also that you cannot transmit voltage. You have to transmit current. Now for that reason you see here there is a we have a float level transmitter which will transmit 4 to 20 milliampere of current to the process. This system, this first it will go through this cord, it will go to the process interface. From the process interface, it will come to the digital computer. Now from the digital computer there are control algorithm by which we can Set the different algorithms, you can tune the controller, it will feedback the system to the process controller. Process controller will take the action, then the signal will go back through this cord again to this control valve. Control valve will make the decision of the flow. Accordingly, you can achieve the particular flow or particular level in this process. This is the miniature versions of the, of the actual process. Actual process might be large, but whatever the components you can see here, this you will find also in the process. In this uh, assembly, you can find uh, several flow meters. There are uh, rotor meters, there are optical uh, flow meter, there are hot wire anemometer, uh, and there is also a uh, magnetic flow meter. On the top of it, you will find there is a uh, wear which is called V-notch wear. As you know, the flow meters are different types. These are some of them are uh, for the open channel and some of them are uh, for the closed channel. This V-notch wear is basically an open channel meter, which will give you the extensively used for the irrigation purposes, so that how much water is needed in the uh, or different fields uh, to get the estimate of that. Now you can see that uh, if you increase the flow here, by this you can have a pump by which you can increase the flow. You see the flow is, uh, I have reduced the flow, so the bob of the flow meter is coming down. And this uh, tapered glass is calibrated in time in terms of uh, centimeter cube per minute. So it will give you the flow. And this height is also calibrated in terms of flow. And you can see here interestingly, this is one uh, electro-optic uh, flow meter. If you go, if I go to the back side, you can see uh, that there are four spots and there are lights which is falling on the flow meter. And uh, for each uh, complete rotations, I am getting four pulses. So accordingly, suppose if I have ten uh, rotations, so accordingly I can calculate the how much the flow is uh, moving. So it is a uh, it is a, has a direct electrical output. As you can see here, this flow meter has no electrical output. Similarly, the hot wire anemometer is also has electrical output and this is the hot wire anemometer we cannot see from here because it is inside and in electro in the magnetic flow meters also it is electrical output. So all these flow meters except this rotor meter has electrical output. Now electrical output has advantages if you have an instrumentation system so if you have electrical output you can directly convert that signal to the current domain 4 to 20 pin ampere of current domain then you can digitize this if it is necessary. Whereas if you have some non-electrical output, either pneumatic outputs or some mechanical movement, that type of things, you have to convert these to the electrical domain by using uh, 
either new electric converters uh, sort of thing or any other term, uh, form of devices. So this will give you the uh, glimpses of the different flow sensors which is used uh, in the industry in the process in the flow meters you will find in any process industry these are thousands in numbers uh, unfortunately here I cannot show you some of the, that type of thing but this will give you the idea of the, how the uh, flow measured in the process See here at the back side of this uh, flow meter uh, system even though you cannot uh, see here clearly the hot well anemometer which is also a resistance based flow meter and electromagnetic flow meter but you can see here the electro optic flow meter you see what will happen in this instrumentation system that there is a light source which will be launched and there are four spots on the back side or four white spots on the back side four white or silver so light will get reflected from that and there is a receiver on the other side so what will happen that when it rotates for each complete rotation of the uh, system you will get four clock pulses so if i can uh, count the number of clock pulses which obviously you have to i mean you have to uh, little signal process you have to make little signal processing in the sense that you have to pass the signal uh, signal shaper like speed trigger you will get output uh, and that can be uh, counted for 60 minutes so that you can get the flow because if you know the flow uh, pipe diameters and all those things you can immediately tell that how much is the flow rate in a minute so this will give you the direct electrical output obviously that can be uh, processed that can be easily interfaced with the computer so this will give the glimpses of the different flow sensors in the system then this can be calibrated obviously with the rotameter which is in the front side which i have shown at the beginning of this lecture welcome back to the classroom so we will now study the instrument characteristics the static characteristics of an instrument are concerned only with the steady state readings okay it is not concerned with the any transient reading so we will only concerned with the steady state reading so we will call one by one now we will read one by one the different static characteristics first of all the span now if in a measuring instrument the highest point of calibration is x2 units and the lowest point of calibration is x1 units i can tell the uh, then the instrument range is x2 units and the instrument span is x2 minus x1 units it is very simple that means suppose i if i have a um, if I have a total I mean range suppose I have an instrument a temperature sense which can measure 5 degree centigrade to um, 200 degree centigrade in that case range I will call it 200 degree centigrade span I will I will call it 195 degree centigrade. Now mean and standard deviation of measurements we will need this in future uh, you will find that is the reason we are explaining suppose we are making a set of n measurement x1 x2 xn and the mean value will be given by x mean x1 plus x2 plus plus so on xn upon n this is x mean this is the mean of the measurements and the spread of any measured value xi can be expressed as a deviation which can be expressed as uh, given as di equal to xi minus x mean. The extent to which the measured values are spread about the mean value are known as known and uh, now we express as standard deviation sigma where sigma equal to d1 square plus d2 square uh, so on dn square upon n minus 1 whole to the power half under the square root. So this is the standard deviations. We need it in future. So we will find that is the reason we are explaining it here. Now accuracy actually uh, means accuracy and precisions. Accuracy is usually expressed as accurate to within x person, even though we have not used exactly used the same. I mean words. So accuracy and accurate slightly different. It is usually we don't I mean like that if somebody express the same word. I mean some definition with the. Uh, with the implanted in the, the same word in the definition itself, but these two are different. So accuracy will explain this more. Accuracy is usually expressed as accurate to within x percent. 
it means accurate to within plus minus x percent of the instrument span at all calibration points of the scale unless otherwise stated. When a temperature transducer with an error of plus minus 1 percent indicates a 100 degree centigrade, the true temperature is somewhere between a 99 degree centigrade and 101 degree centigrade. Thus, the measurement accuracy of plus minus 1 percent defines how close the measurement is to the actual measured quantity. So, this is the main text thus the measurement accuracy of plus minus 1 percent defines how close the measurement is to the actual measured quantities. How much is the deviation that is actually the, we talk about the accuracy. <coughs> Linearity if the calibration is very important because in instrumentation you know always we prefer a linear sensor. There is a lot of problem if you have it do not have a linear sensor. You will find that what do you mean means the input output relation should be linear. Forget about the accuracy, we can have a, we, I can have a characteristics like this one also. I can say it is a, it is a non-linear, but it can be very accurate. But the, there is, if the linear is ease of calibration will be there. That means that if I can calibrate an instrument, if it is linear instruments, is, its the calibration is quite simple. Its sensitivity will be same at all positions. Why? You see here, I have this type of, so it does not matter where I take the sensitivity, uh, sorry, sensitivity means same. Whereas, if you uh, if you take some other suppose here in this curve, sensitivity will something here and it will somewhere here it will be different. So, uh, while you are making the signal conditioning circuitry it will be very difficult, the task will be very very hard that means your uh, I mean amplifier should also be adaptive, it is very difficult task. So, always we prefer linear instrument, but some instruments, some sensor like thermocouple, thermistor, it is non-linear sensor, we cannot do anything because of its low cost, easy deployability. there are so many other positive points we have sacrificed that. Mm, sacrifice that it is a non-linear. I mean, we we want to accommodate it, even though it is a non-linear sensor. Now, it is normally desirable that the output reading of an instrument is linearly proportional to the quantity being measured. Figure 1.2 shows a calibration curve that is a plot of the typical output reading cross mark of an instrument when the sequence of input quantities is applied to it. We'll show in the next slide. A good fit straight line will give the calibration curve of the instrument. How does it look? Nonlinearity is thus defined as the maximum deviations of any of the output readings marked with a cross from the straight line and it is usually expressed as a percentage of the full scale reading. You see that we talked about the figure 1.2 measured quantity. You see here that this is our measured quantity. So, we make a best fit curve, there are various softwares available, so by which least square method is that by which you can make a best fit curve, so that it will be a best fit for all the points which you have given. So, this is our deviations, ok, is not it, I mean that means this is our deviations, this is our deviations, ok, this is our deviation, this is our deviation. So, this is nonlinearity is thus defined as the maximum deviations of any of the output readings marked with a cross from this straight line and it is usually expressed as a percentage of full scale reading. Always it should be expressed in percentage of full scale reading. Now, tolerance it is a term that is closely related to the accuracy and defines the maximum error which is to be expected on some value. It is not exactly a static characteristics obviously, you know that however, some instrument manufacturers usually quote that I mean quote this tolerance figure. So, you must know what is the tolerance. One of the good example those who are not familiar with the instrument tolerance, it is that maximum deviation of a manufactured component from some specified value. You are familiar with that, why? You see for an example, a resistor having a nominal value of 100 ohm and a tolerance of 5 percent might be have an actual value anywhere between 95 ohm and 105 ohm. There are resistors are available of so various tolerance 1 percent, 10 percent, 2 percent depending on. Uh, so, if it tolerance band is important because not always you will find the 0.1 percent tolerance. If you with the 5 percent tolerance, uh, I mean measurement is ok, there is no problem. Why it is saying, I am saying you see that if my measurement error is a 5 percent, that means tolerance band is coming 5 percent, ultimately what will do with this uh, such a precise measurements? Ultimately the quality of the product, if the quality of the product does not deteriorate, I can amount, I mean I can allow certain amount of tolerances is not it. If it is not, if the product ultimately product falls 
Suppose in some I mean uh, chemical plants and I mean you can I have to precise if there is 5 degree centigrade temperature variation suppose there, there is a you are controlling some temperatures of uh, suppose 600 degree centigrade it hardly matters if the, the temperature varies to 598 to uh, 602 degree centigrade whereas in some process suppose in the case of bio process we will find that where the cell grows in that type of situation if the, even the difference of temperature of 0.5 degree might be detrimental to the cell, cell will die. So, in that type of situations you cannot allow the temperature to. So, these are tolerance are there so everywhere. <coughs> now, static error it is the difference between the true value of a time invariant measurable quantity and the value indicated by the instrument. The static error is expressed as plus y units or minus y units. And for static error in units, true value plus static error is the instrument reading, or true value equal to instrument reading plus static correction, quite obviously, because it is opposite of that is a static error. Now, repeatability is very important, is uh, repeatability is in instrumentation. If you see that the I mean, um, uh, if you there are thousands of instruments in a big plant, thousands of sensors, I mean, so temperature, pressure, flow. Uh, you cannot expect that the you will calibrate the instruments every day or every I was I was once in a seven days usually the typical norm is that there is routine maintenance routine I mean checking of all this calibration but if there is a uh, if the fall of quality of some of the then we will talk and for some of the product we will talk about the instrument calibrations or sensor calibrations otherwise not so repeatability uh, repeatability is defined as the of an instrument is the degree of closeness with which a measurable quantity may be repeatedly measured. What does it mean? Suppose I have a voltmeter. So, I, I am giving a battery voltage. So, battery voltage is suppose a dry cell battery voltage, voltage is fixed 1.5 volts. So, if I even measure 1000 times it should always give 1.5 volts by that instrument or voltmeter. I would say that this repeatability is good because battery voltage is not changing supposed to I mean suppose it is dry cell battery if you are not drawing any current from that much because usually voltmeter does not draw much current. So, it is uh, if you take the 1000 reading it should give you this exactly same value 1.5 volt. If it does not that means the repeatability is poor. Now, mathematically how you define this repeatability? Mathematically it is defined as the measure of the variation in the measured data known as the standard deviation sigma. It is expressed in terms of maximum repeatability error as a percentage of full scale output range, right. So, it is repeatability uh, 2 sigma full scale output range into 100, this is a percentage repeatability. Now, static sensitivity is very important. The slope of a static calibration curve evaluated at the input value yields the static sensitivity, right. It means that as shown in figure 1.3 will show it will come the static sensitivity at any particular input value say x1 is expressed as this. This is a figure 1 you can see here. So, this is a calibration curve this is my input sorry. Yes. You see here, they are, uh, this is our this is our calibration curve. This is our calibration curve, right? It is going like this. It's so, non-linear. It does not matter. So you see here, the, this is my input, and this is output reading. The input is some parameters, and output we are getting some reading. Excuse me. The static sensitivity is defined as at x1 value. Suppose if I say this is the x1 at the value x1 the slope of this I mean calibration curve. So, it is dy by dx at x equal to x1. Interestingly you see the static sensitivity varies you see here is some there is some value here it is some different value. So, the static sensitivity for the nonlinear curve will change it depends on the what point you are measuring right. You will find this typically uh, true that in the case of thermocouple. Thermocouple you will find that typically we say some range suppose of the platinum platinum rhodium thermocouple. We say that the statics, I mean, its sensitivity is around 10 to 12 microvolt per degree centigrade. It is nonlinear. Suppose in some range you will find 10 microvolt per degree centigrade, some other range you may find 12 microvolt per degree centigrade, some other range even less, might be 6 to 7 microvolt per degree centigrade.
Now, calibration actually it is very important, it is a procedure that the involve a comparison of the particular instrument with either a primary standard number 1, a secondary standard with higher accuracy than the instrument to which to be calibrated or a known output source right. What does it mean? It is a primary standard that means I can calibrate my instruments with a very accurate instrument by going to some national laboratory or some other places. I can calibrate that instrument with a secondary standard of higher accuracy. I can use some other instruments which I know that are accurate. So, I can calibrate because you see the uh, it is hardly in industrial instrumentation that you find that the instruments are of absolute type that means you do not it does not need any calibrations. You have to calibrate each and every instrument. So, most of the instruments you will find in that cases what will happen that I must calibrate either with some primary standard. Suppose I have a th I, am, I mean I have given you a RTD. So, you must calibrate that with some, some small range suppose I can calibrate with some standard market in glass manometers. So, I can calibrate uh, like that or I can calibrate with some suppose boiling water which is supposed to be for normal pressure and temperature normal pressure it should be 100 degree centigrade for the pure water. So, that way we can calibrate right or I can calibrate with a known output source. What is that? I will show you. For an example, a flow meter can be calibrated with a standard flow meter available in the national laboratory. This is number one. Number two, it can be calibrated with a another flow meter of known accuracy. It can be directly calibrated with a primary measurement such as a uh, such as weighing a certain amount of water in a tank or a recording time required for this quantity to flow through the meter. What how does it look? It looks like this. It looks like suppose I have a flow meter, I, I have a vessel. So, I know how much is the height, I know the how much the water is flowing out to this one. So, I can tell the what is the flow rate because if I have a stopwatch I can tell. So, this is a some other form of a calibration. So, I know the quantity of water, I know that time, so I know the volume, so I can find the volume rate that means V by time. If I so, I can liter per minute I can tell that how much the volume. So, I can calibrate in that way also right. Now, dread zone or dead space is another important uh, factor. Now, in many instrument you will find it has a dead zone. Dead zone is the largest value of a measured variable for which the instrument does not respond right. What does it mean? Suppose I have a pressure gauge which is measuring a pressure of 10 to the power 5 psi. So, in that type of pressure gauge you will if you give a, um, a 50 psi you, you will find that there is no movement of the uh, pointer. So, that is the 50 psi is the dead zone of that type of instrument right. So, dead zone usually occurs with a friction in a mechanical measurement system. Hysteresis is another important, hysteresis error refers to the difference between the upscale sequence of calibration and downscale sequence of calibration and the hysteresis error of an instrument is given by y upscale minus y downscale at x equal to x 1. What does it mean? It looks like this. The hysteresis error is depicted in figure and is usually expressed in terms of the maximum hysteresis error as a percentage of full scale output range. Hysteresis error equal to a hysteresis maximum hysteresis error upon full scale output range multiplied by 100. It looks like this figure you can see here, you see. So, this is our hysteresis error at x equal to x1. So, this if you take the full scale output range, so I will get the I mean total hysteresis is a or I should say that it is a non matching of the um, upscale calibration and downscale calibrations. It may happen in some instrument that it does not match it. In that case we will call it hysteresis. The input impedance are the input of each component in a measuring system there exists a variable x i 1 and at the same point there is associated with x i 2 another variable such that the product has the dimension of power. When the these two signals are identified we can define the input impedance as shown by z i equal to x i 1 a minus upon x i 2. This is important because some instrument uh, and the I mean 
So, here the power drain is P d equal to x i by z i x i x i 1 square by z i and that large input impedance is needed to keep the power drain small because in some instruments some sensor you will find like a uh, like a pH meter all this it uh, needs very small should draw very small current. So, this is very important because if it draws uh, large current it cannot measure the voltage actually because it has internal large source impedance right. Now, resolution is another important this measurement precision of an instrument define the smallest change uh, in, in measured quantity that can be observed right. Suppose I have a thermometer 0.2 degree centigrade is the minimum. So, it is again 0.2 degree centigrade for example, is it looks like this it is in a temperature transducer if the 0.2 degree centigrade is the smallest temperature change observed then the measurement resolution is 0.2 degree centigrade. Now, bias is another important it means a constant error exists over the full range of measurement of an instrument. The error can be easily removed by the calibration. For an example, a voltmeter perhaps shows a reading of 1 volt with no input voltage to its terminal. If now a known voltage of 30 volt is applied to the voltage, the reading should be 31 volt. So, obviously, I can this constant bias of 1 volt can be removed by calibrations or by simply mechanical electrical means suppose by adjusting the needle or in case of auto voltmeter. So, I mean we should take care with some charge some capacitors when there is no I mean input voltage and so, so that that bias voltage will be charged accordingly it will be subtracted or added to the final value when you are measuring some voltage. Drift is that the calibration of an instrument is usually performed under the some control conditions of temperature and pressure because not always we have have a control condition. So, it, there will drift in the measurements as variation occurs in the ambient temperature etc. Some static characteristics change namely zero drift and the sensitivity. Sensitivity may change zero of the instruments may change. So, zero drift it is it describes the effect where the zero reading of an instrument is modified for the change in ambient conditions. And for an example, the zero drift of a voltmeter, zero of voltmeter uh, for the ambient temperature change is expressed in volts per degree centigrade. This is the sometimes called the zero drift coefficient related to the temperature changes. If there are several environmental parameters, then it will have a several zero drift coefficient. Effect of zero drift is to impose bias on the instrument. Sensitivity drift is another because sensitivity sensitivity also may change. It defines the amount by which an instrument sensitivity. It is a defines the amount by which an instrument sensitivity of the measurement varies as ambient condition changes. Right. So this is all about uh, the basic introductions of the industrial instrumentations. I will give the static characteristics in details, and you understood by this time what how the role of the what is the role of the instrumentation and how important it is and, uh, and that the uh, instrument the responsible of the instrumentation engineers to maintain all those sensors, signal conditioning, circuitry uh, type of things. This ends the lesson 1.